We're very uh, excited um, and honored that, that Hannah Carrillo is, is here uh, joining us um, to talk about the importance of, of local and municipal government. You know, she is currently the le uh, legislative liaison for the mayor of Somerville, but she's been working in, in city government for, for a little while um, before moving on to become the, uh, the legislative liaison for the mayor. Um, I do want to make it clear that Hannah is here um, on her own. She is not representing the mayor uh, of Somerville, um, and we are grateful for her uh, time and generosity um, in terms of joining us tonight. Um, you know, in uh, local government, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about state and federal government, but I, I do think one of the most important areas that um, often gets overlooked because, you know, state and federal government get all the press. You know, they, it's, it's uh, not all the press, but so much of the press that local government is where so many of the changes um, are made and also so many of uh, so many ground, you know, you know, groundbreaking things are are born. You know, you think about, um, I think it was you, you, same sex marriage. Yeah, that started in in on the West Coast. I think it was, and and it, and it was it was it was you know sort of a a, a city type thing, city town thing. Um, you think about, um, you think about um, free transportation. You know, the the MBTA. I think it you know it started a, a few. Uh, the trial trial of, of of some free transportation, free bus lines. You know, it started in, in with with Mayor Mayor Janey, and now Mayor Wu has expanded it. And now that there now there are there are places around the around Massachusetts who are who are expanding into into that. Um, you know, sort of early early child yeah, sort of child care. You know, with with uh, with state employee with city employees that was started. Um, in the city of Boston, and then the treasurer's office took it up, and now I think the AG's office. So a lot of that starts in in city government, and you know, and, and you know, it, I, I was mentioning to Hannah that I saw in the in the Globe a couple of Sundays ago that that um, the city of Somerville is 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 started a public safety for all task force, and you know that's something which you know it's small now, you know it's a sort of a, a a committee, a task force now, but that can lead to hopefully substantive change in in the future. So it's a lot of these things get started in 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 local government, and um, you know, and and a lot of the leaders that we see today got started as as either school committee members, city councilors, mayors, and you know that's sort of the the proving ground or or the you know the the, for lack of a better word, to use to, to use a sports analogy, the farm system for for more folks um, to, for you know state and, and federal government. So local government is is where we can also get our start. Um, you know whether it's on a task force like the one that I mentioned, or 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 a commission. You know whether it's an arts commission or or something like that. You know I think that this is where local government is, is very very important. So. Um, so thank you so much for for joining us, Hannah. Yeah, you know, we really do appreciate your time, and you know, you know, thank you for you know, thank you for uh, for making time to join us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's it's great to to be here and speaking with you all. I love things like this that bring people together and just let them, you know, kind of talk amongst themselves and explore and and. Uh, Thought it was interesting. I was glad to be able to catch the last bit of of the previous presentation. I thought it was interesting when you said to to treasure the space because I feel I feel that very much whenever I'm in a space of um, you know housing wonks or, or other kind of um, kind of you know nerdy things. So it's nice to be in in welcome spaces. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Hannah Cahedra. I grew up in New York City. Um, I actually ended up at UMass Boston because my mother lived at in, in Massachusetts at the time, so I got in-state tuition. So it was a bit random, um, but I'm definitely happy that I landed here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I got my start also a little bit randomly after grad school. I struggled to find a job. Um, you know, I got a policy degree, which was pretty vague. I didn't um, study any specific policy. And I also, you know, I'm a housing policy person now, but I did not know that was a thing when I was in grad school. Um, that was not any any class that I was offered. It wasn't something anybody talked about. Um, so, you know, it was, I, I consider it lucky that I ended up not being able to find a job. So I started temping for Metro Boston Housing. Um, and that's where I 
my eyes <laughs> were open to this whole new policy branch. Um, you know, I also, I grew up in public housing. So to get to better understand that system that I grew up in yet somehow knew nothing about was really fascinating to me. Um, so, you know, I think starting, um, just my professional career it was my first real job um, at a nonprofit that did direct service uh, was was really fascinating. And it was, you know, it's tough work. Direct service is, is definitely really challenging. Doing casework is challenging. I had a caseload of Section 8 tenants um, and it was a lot to learn about, but it also really opened up um, a lot of different ways of thinking that I hadn't considered before. And I um, was really lucky to end up to ending up finding a job at the city of Somerville where I now work. Um, in housing policy. So, you know, one of the things that I think is, is really great about local government is how specific and unique they are to the space. Um, and at that time, the city of Somerville had made a really strong commitment to affordable housing. Um, they had spent the prior year um, doing a study that ended up with 18 recommendations for you know, policies, programs, things to push that all had to do with affordable housing. And then they needed a staff person that was actually going to do those things. Um, so that, that's where I came along. And I got, to, and I, I got the opportunity to be that staff person and to start implementing, um, you know, and when I say implementing, I mean, very, very slowly <laughs> start looking into this long list of recommendations that were made. Um, so, you know, suffice it to say, there's a lot of different ways to end up in government and there's a lot of different spaces that you can occupy. Um, you know, my colleagues do everything under the sun. Um, in the mayor's office, I, I, talk, <laughs> I talk about school things, I talk about um, buildings, infrastructure, roads, water, all kinds of, of different random things. Then there's also the city council. So, you know, I work in the mayor's office, but it's very important that the different bodies work together. Um, and, you know, I, I make the point about cities being unique because that also applies to their government structure. So in Somerville, we have a mayor and we have 11 city councilors. Um, but that's how we do it specifically in Somerville. Obviously, you know, Boston is different. Um, I think Boston has 13 city councilors. Cambridge has a city manager and a mayor. So there's a ton of different ways. Um, that's, uh, you know, cities and towns kind of organize themselves. Um, and, you know, there's long histories to dictate why different cities and towns went in different ways. Um, that being said, I think what's most important is what we do with the structures that we have now and that we put in the time to change those structures where they need change. Um, and that takes a lot of all kinds of power, right? It, it takes budgeting power. You have to put the money to the thing. It takes staff time, it takes expertise, it takes all these different things that have to come together. Um, so in any like one thing that a city does, like a hundred things had to happen to make that one little thing happen. And I'm sure there are like triple the staff people that you might think that thing needed to get done. Um, and, you know, part of why I'm being so vague is because it, there's just so much. So what I really want to do is also hear your questions about city government, because I could sit here all day and talk just about the Department of Public Works if that's what you wanted. So I don't want to, um, you know, just be um, talking at you. I would love to hear your different questions and um, kind of speak to what interests you. Um, but, you know, just kind of at the high level, there are a ton of city jobs right now in all cities, um, cities and towns. I don't only mean to say cities. Um, and, you know, I think that the market is kind of weird right now and it's a great time to just jump into something. Also, jobs aside, there are so many volunteer opportunities. There are so many boards and commissions that make important decisions that, you know, need representation from all corners of the city that don't necessarily have it. We have the same people applying over and over. And yes, the city has to do better at its recruitment, but people also need to apply. So I encourage you all to apply to whatever you see, to whatever is interesting to you, because that's how you start, right, is you just jump on in. Um, so, you know, and I, I, I don't want to make it seem like we just operate in a vacuum. Obviously, the state is a very important piece to what municipal governments can do. Um, in Massachusetts specifically, we are a little bit more hamstrung than most, I would say, in other states. The state of Massachusetts requires permission to do a ton of 
what I would call pretty basic things that we should be able to do on our own. Um, anything to do with raising a tax, having a tax, anything to do that changes the, the relationship between a landlord and a tenant, all of these things need state permission before the city can enact. So there's so much advocacy going on at the city level, so much work that we are putting into making our own laws better, into you know making sure that, that we're being responsive to our population. That being said, a ton of work is also getting put into trying to get the state house to let us do what we think would be best for our residents. So, um, you know, like I said, there's a ton of different ways to get involved in local government, but one of the main functions of local government is to advocate for its own residents. And that is done, um, you know, by every department on a variety of different levels, you know, whether it's your infrastructure and working with um, the MBTA or Mass Dot or um, DCR. There are so many layers and levels, um, and you know, I, I know that every municipality just wishes it had control over its own space, but it's unfortunately not even remotely that that clear cut. Um, so, you know, I think that it's really important that people are involved and engaging. And please vote if you can vote because it, the city council has a huge impact on the work that is done and how staff time is spent. We had a city council election this past election cycle that was decided by 80 votes. So it is incredibly important that people come and vote. Our, our voter turnout is very low and that's just a, you know, it's one way where people can have their voices be heard. I know people probably get a lot of survey requests and things like that, but if your city or town is asking you to fill out a survey, it would be great if you did, because that data is being asked of you for a reason. Um, I know it's tedious, but like those little things really make a difference in, this, in any city or town being able to accurately judge the needs of its population. So, um, you know, before I started working for the city, I had not engaged. I don't own a car. I don't own any property. I had not had any single reason <laughs> to go to my city government. I wasn't going to public meetings. I didn't know that that is how things operated. You really have to look for that information. And that is something that I think we absolutely need to change. And I know that Somerville works really hard to change that. I can only speak for, you know, what I know. I've also seen a ton coming out of the city of Boston. I know it's a priority there as well. But, you know, while we're still working on bettering that process, you all need to look for those opportunities because they're there. And, you know, the more people that turn out, the better. Um, so, you know, I, whatever form that takes, um, I think it's, it's just so important that we're getting voices that are, are beyond the folks that have the privilege of being able to be at every meeting and, and being able to, you know, send long emails in the middle of the day and things like that. Um, so the more you can communicate and the more you can engage, the better. Um, again, I can't speak for other cities, but if you send the mayor's office an email, somebody will get back to you at some point in time. So make your voice heard. There is no wrong way to do that as long as you're like, you know, polite and nice about it. There is no wrong way to engage and to voice a concern or see how you can get involved. Um, you know, I think that that local government, it does a ton of different things. One of them is, is connecting people to resources. So government is not always the resource you need. Sometimes it's just the conduit to get you to what you need. Um, you know, 311 is, is another just really basic, low impact thing that is really important and gets people information. So, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of opportunities to get involved in your local government and and I, there are not in my mind any downside to doing so um but you know i think also there's just a general acknowledgement that we we need more more engagement and and that's that's a two way street that's absolutely you know um just in general government needs to build trust that is something that that i think is is weak at this point in time and it's something that's incredibly important to my my colleagues and i and i know that it's important to our neighboring cities and towns um but I can't speak for all of them. And all I can say is that the, the more people push, the more people really get involved and the more people are loud about that exclusivity, the more it has to change. Um, obviously easier said than done. And everybody knows how slow 
things go. Um, but I will say the slowest work I do is the work that's involved at the state house. <laughs> so most of my municipal work has gotten done after my my six -ish years at the city now, and I am still waiting for all of my my state house priorities. <laughs> so you know, I think local government is is a place where you can actually see some results and and make some some connections um, to your neighbors, quite frankly. So. Those are my general thoughts on local government. But like I said, I really want to answer your questions. And um, I don't know what you all don't know. So I would I would love to, to you know, jump in if, if folks have um, thoughts or, or anything they want to ask about. Any questions for Hannah? Clive. Clive has his hand up. That was fast, Clive. And then Jessica. So. Yeah. Um... Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much. My name is Clive Lawrence. I'm a student at Harvard College. Um, yeah, I just um, would love for you to like speak more about, you know, how you or your uh, or the mayor's office in Somerville kind of um, approaches being engaged with the community in different aspects, um, whether through constituent services, like if you could just talk more in detail about that. Yeah, I think it, it definitely depends on what the thing is. We have some standard um, channels that we work with um, the communications department on to, um, you know, when we have a press release, it, it goes to like a standard list of people. We also have um, a newsletter. We have social media. Um, we do a lot of task force and work task forces and working groups, which is, def is essentially a call to the public to, you know, join this this body of work that's usually pretty specific around something like um like the public uh safety task force so you know i think it kind of depends on what type of engagement we're looking for um we also have a really robust arts council which puts on awesome events and um you know is, is always um looking for new ways to engage they also provide grants to local artists so i think that there's a kind of a ton of different ways the city engages, but I think also we're putting a lot of resources into making that engagement more accessible and more equitable. So we're investing in, um, well, investing, we're getting Zoom instead of go to meeting because on Zoom, you can have closed captioning and translation. So we're gonna, so we're, we're shifting to try to actually make our, our meetings, you know, more accessible in language capacity ways, but also um, we're hoping, again, Steakhouse, please, we're hoping that we can maintain our ability to do hybrid meetings so we don't have to go back to fully in person because obviously there are um, barriers um, to engagement in, in that regard as well. Um, so I think it's it's not only just, you know, getting the press release out, letting the public know, but it's how you're letting the public know and what channels you're using. Um, so we're really trying to deepen those channels. And, you know, I think a lot of our focus is also um, on trying to get more representation on our boards and commissions, because those do make a lot of decisions that are really important for the city. And, you know, it's important that they're not just um, kind of speaking for one demographic. Um, I hope that was that was helpful. <laughs> Very helpful. Thank you so much. Okay. Jessica and then Gloria. Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much for um, the information. I really appreciate it. Um, so I know that uh, the city of Somerville just went through a charter review, correct? Just went through slash still going through. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yeah. can you provide, so I'm a part of the charter review committee for the city of Cambridge, um, and we're currently working on that. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you could talk about that work in regards to engaging um, young professionals. I know Somerville has a lot of young professionals, a lot of diversity, um, and what we're seeing, at least in Cambridge, is like a lack of um, engagement from this population of people, um, and then they're discrediting because they're students, and they're leaving, and they're renters, and all this stuff, but I don't think that's enough of <laughs> an excuse to not include these populations, so how is the city of Somerville um, incorporating their, um, like, in engagement in regards to the charter review and like in regards to voters and just the fact that you guys are a thriving like Bo like Boston itself like a thriving um community for young students and young professionals like how are we incorporating their voices if we're not asking them to vote or if they're not showing up and then we're saying they're not showing up but they're in school so how are we um incorporating voices that are not there and I know that's always a question but I'm just wondering what the city of Somerville is doing thank you 
No, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I myself was not um, involved in the charter review process, but um, just in general, I think the way that it worked was that a charter review committee was formed and that specific committee worked for, I believe, about a year um, with a consultant to develop um, a set of recommendations and that recommendation or those recommendations are now being reviewed by the city council. The council is having, I think, bi-weekly meetings um, where they're um, discussing different components of the charter. Ultimately, they will um, put out their recommendation. I think the thinking is that it's going to ultimately go to the state house. So the city council and the mayor are going to have to agree on one version, send it to the state house um, for a home rule petition. As far as I know, I think it's going to trigger a ballot question. So I think that's how it's ultimately going to get decided is on the ballot. Um, but I think a good amount of that is still TBD. We're not even at the state house yet. Um, so just <laughs> that is, that's where our process is. Um, I'm not super familiar with what the outreach was with that specific group. Um, but what I can speak to is boards and commissions kind of more broadly. Um, and I can speak to that because Mayor Ballantyne, when she first took office, um, tasked us all with, you know, centering equity um, in a lot of the longstanding institutions um, that hadn't been looked at in quite some time. And one of those is our boards and commissions. Um, and I got to, to take the lead on that and um, do, you know, basically a, a complete reevaluation of our board and commission process. And so much of this has been about how do we make this work for people who are not general coming to the table and you know regularly at the table how do we shift this population that has predominantly been senior white men and women um to actually representing the population of somerville which to your point is very diverse in a lot of different ways it's economically diverse it is agely diverse there's a lot of different um folks doing a lot of different stuff in Somerville. It's, it's you know, it's also a big pass-through city, which is uh, a different issue, <laughs> but there's a lot going on here and that needs to be captured and that needs to be reflected in these bodies that are making actual decisions. They're issuing permits. They're, you know, um, determining, you know, one of them is, is is the Board of Health. Like that is something that, that needs to be reflective of our population. So um, I've been working very closely with the Director of Office of Racial and Social Justice and I saw somebody shouted her out in the chat. I definitely agree. Denise Molina Capers is the bee's knees. Um, so I've been working with her for a long time. We are still, we have a lot of work to do, um, but we are essentially top to bottom trying to reestablish how we do our board and commission recruiting, not only recruiting, but so recruiting, interviewing, selection, recommendation, the whole process. Um, but we have been stuck at recruiting for a very long time. Not to say that we're not working on the other things, but recruiting is 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 it right this is what we need to bring people to the table and when i say build trust we need people to feel like they can engage to feel like they should apply like they will actually you know like there will be value in that effort that they're taking so that's on us to make sure that that is being heard and felt and seen and you know to take it further is that it's actually made accessible that you actually can can come, that it's not going to be, you know, at noon on a Tuesday when everybody is either in work or in class or what have you. So, look, I don't have a great answer to your question. I can just say that we're trying real hard to figure out how to lower every barrier we can possibly lower to get that engagement. But that trust building takes a lot of time. And we recognize that it takes a lot of time. So, it's not just, you know, we're not going to put out like a reworded press release and all of a sudden we're going to have a line of folks at the door. It's it's a process and it's one that is absolutely, you know, we're all committed to doing and committed to doing correctly, but it's not going to shift overnight. It's definitely, you know, a long, a long haul. And um, to be honest, I believe that the Charter Review Committee was fairly white. I don't think there was a whole lot of diversity on that particular committee. And I know that that was something that at some point was flagged but ultimately if those are the folks that showed up and participated those are the folks that showed up and participated i'm not saying that you know that's how it should have gone i 
personally no idea how it actually went down, but that's an ongoing issue, is that our task forces and these groups that are being formed do not necessarily represent the communities that they are serving or the communities that are really going to be impacted by the work that they're doing. So another example, um, we also did, I don't know if it was a task force working group, whatever, but it was committed to um, participatory budgeting. And that's a new um, effort that we're doing in Somerville. It's going to be the first time that we're going to do it. Um, it's going to be a million dollars that um, citizens can vote on. Um, there's a whole to do of a process and I, <laughs> I cannot recite it from memory. Um, but that was a task force that we felt really had to be representative because they were going to write the book on how it's going to work. And if they're doing that, if they're doing that initial work, then that needs to be done right. So then when we actually do it, we're not just replicating something that is not, um, that doesn't work for our population. So, you know, in that case, if I recall correctly, we designated different seats. So there was like a seat for um, a parent of a kid in Somerville school. So like kind of specific, but making sure that we were getting those different areas. And I, there's, there's often seats that are designated for youth, but that can mean different things in different spaces. So for example, on the, this is, sorry, real in the weeds, but the Urban um, Forestry Commission just appointed, um, oh, she's not on the agenda yet, next agenda, will appoint um, a youth member. So this person has to be between the ages of 14 and 17. It's in the ordinance that two seats on the Urban Forestry Commission have to be um, dedicated to youth. So, um, that is one way that we do it pretty concretely is that different seats are designated for different things. Um, but part of our reevaluation is also looking into those designations and are those designations functional? Like, do they actually further the purpose of the board and commission? Do they get us the diversity that we're really looking for? So looking at all of that is something that we are actively doing right now. Um, but it's a big bucket of work and there's a lot of work left to do. <laughs> Sorry, I know that was a lot, but I spent a lot of my time in that particular space. Oh, that was Thank great. You. I think you you, you did a, a great job as to sort of laying out you know, what's happening, some of the obstacles that we face, and you know, again, going back to the it's it's a it's a you know, a lot of this was you know predated your you know the the new mayor, um, and you know not to not to cast aspersions on the old mayor or anything like that, but it, a lot of it is just you know, it it predated you and actually. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 sort of some of the some of the work that you you all have to do in terms of you know becoming more inclusive and 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 you know laying the groundwork and you know going going back to sort of what we've been talking about it it'll take a little while it's it's you know adding one or two or three or four new people at a time sometimes if you can get ten at a time awesome but that's not easy you know because the the groundwork has been laid for such a long time and the and the rules of the game have been have been created to to keep people like us out of these spaces yeah you know, how do we get how do people like us get into these spaces with the rules that have existed for so long and then if we try to you know to kind of change those rules it's oh look what they're doing her you know one of those types of deals and so it is it is again it's a it's just constant just being relentless and trying to you know break these things down and little by little changing the rules here changing the rules there getting one or two people here and there but but again yeah so yeah but so i think you know what you're doing now is is you know is is a, is a wonderful start now it's just kind of just kind of keep plugging away and and where you can find whenever and wherever you can find allies you know that's where that's you know that's where you go and that's where we go you know, we, we become allies of people who are trying to help. So anyway, um, Gloria and then David had a question in the chat. Thanks, Leverett. Um, and thank you, Hannah, for joining us. Can you all hear me okay? My internet's a little bit unstable. Oh, you're okay. great. That's a great, that's Wonderful. great internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's been cutting in and out a little bit. So if I get cut off, I'll just put my question in the chat. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll try turning on my video too. <laughs> um, see if this works. So just just briefly um, to the previous point, a couple of other examples of uh, where I think Somerville has done a great job with boards and commissions. And 
um, for context as well, I am a Somerville resident in Ward 2, um, and so have worked um, in Somerville a little bit through MAPC, where our team helped with putting together a committee for the uh, mayor to, to support the mayor in deciding how to spend ARPA funds, the American Rescue Plan Act funds to go towards COVID relief. Um, I think you know some some folks from MAPC did some really great work there in terms of bringing together a really diverse committee, um, taking into consideration to language access and having folks with different. Um, language capabilities um, on that committee. Um, and then the other one I would point to is I live right around Union Square. I think I, I saw David mention the new Green Line station there um, and a lot of the gentrification displacement concerns. Um, I know the city definitely has on its mind. Um, one project that I uh, have been following is around the redesign of the open space in Union Square where they put together a, uh, a community design team um, with consultants working on that project um, that really comprised of folks who look like the residents of Union Square and folks that, as you were saying, Hannah, typically don't come to uh, the table with municipal planning projects and don't have that civic self-esteem um, that some other older home owning white folks have um, and just really found that having those folks um, do the outreach and be the face of outreach made a really big difference um, in who whose input was uh, taken into consideration there. Um, all that aside, just just being a, a cheerleader, a champion here for, for Somerville. Um, but my question for you, Hannah, is I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more to um, what are the decisions that the state has to sort of make and pass down to municipalities? Um, it, my understanding is it's sort of like a designated list of particular um, subject areas that the state sort of owns or, or has jurisdiction over, whereas anything that is not designated in that category is up to the up to cities and municipalities. Is that correct? Um, Diego might actually know this a little bit better than I do. I know taxes for sure. We cannot increase taxes in any, any way without state permission. And I know very specifically we can't do anything that changes the tenant landlord relationship. Um, I don't know offhand what the standard list is, but I bet we could look it up. Yeah, if you want to look it up, Hannah, while I I think about it. So <laughs> and and some of and you know, like I my sister's funny, my sister is currently in law school, and there are certain like property laws and regulations that I think is like the basis upon which so many of Massachusetts dynamics between state and local government goes between so as an example like property owners that's like changing anything that would change their ability to own property is what requires state approval so like to hannah's point some of the ongoing conversations around tenant protections and eviction protections like at the root of it all it comes back to like as a property owner these are my rights you are changing those rights that needs to be approved by the state type of thing. Revenue, you can make the argument, also is in this kind of realm of like property rights. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I got to work with Hannah and got to meet her working on transfer fee legislation. So for, as an example, like, well, I, I don't know about Somerville's. I have a work question for you, Hannah, at some other point, but like several communities have um, filed home rule petitions that would allow that municipality to levy an, ex an additional fee on properties over a certain amount with that money going back to the, to that municipality so they can use those funds for housing related projects. But in order to levy that fee on a property, you need state approval for it. You need state approval to increase your, your sales tax, your, you know, any kind of fees um, the other bucket that I would kind of throw in this um, for whatever reason is liquor licenses. So if, for any municipality, if they want to um, change or add a liquor license for a new bar or a new restaurant or whatever it might be, that needs to be approved by the state. Why? I have no idea. 
Um, and but there's all these, you know, things like charter you were somebody was talking about earlier. So like changing board of selectmen to members of a select board that needs to be approved by the state house. So there's like all these random things that you know I think on my end when I'm always thinking about like legislation for the next session, I'm always like I always boil it down to like what like does this need state approval or not and and i don't know what these buckets are gloria but i think that's a good way of thinking and conceptualizing like what municipalities are able to do so i'll turn it over to hannah i hope that's stalled enough (laughs) i could not find a quick easy list unfortunately but i will do some digging later and see if i can um follow up but i think changes to the charter is a big one so like we're about to submit a home rule petition so we can add an alternative an alternate seat to a board like that that's it that's all we want to do is add another seat and have it be an alternate (laughs) but we need state permission to do that um so if you're changing anything in the charter it needs a home rule petition um and and just the other one and i'll throw into that i it's like so mundane but it comes back to like money and and a municipality's ability to change money things is um pension changes so in boston for example we have a lot of like police officers that retire early or retire late or whatever it might be and they need their or or some of them die in you know in service um and and so like changing some of like the benefits for police officers or their families or for firefighters or a waiver for them to you know like all these like random small mundane things that like you never really think about but like the point i'm trying to make is um there are things that the city is municipalities are able to do but there's so many things that just require state house legislation, which, you know, I, like Joel had mentioned, there are times where that's a really good thing. I think for Hannah and our work is a really frustrating um, time mo- most of the time. Um, but anyways, that's just that's just uh, my two cents. Yeah, and it is it's a bit stricter in Massachusetts. It's been my my sense is that there's a lot more flexibility in other states. So thanks, Puritans. I suppose. (laughs) Great. Thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for tag teaming on that answer. So thanks Diego. Thanks Hannah. (laughs) Um, David's question in the chat is is after congratulating you on the Green Line station, long time coming, congratulations. Um, (laughs) How is Somerville thinking about mitigating the gentrification displacement that accelerates with it, uh, city and our state strategies? In other words, how are we going to solve world peace? (laughs) <laughs> and because of- how is that how sorry that sorry love it you broke out you broke up um but i'll just turn okay, over to sorry Hannah. about that yeah i mean it's, okay. the gentrification, it's, it's, it's hitting every city in oh, God. Okay. yeah yeah it is um <laughs> that is the million dollar question and you know honestly we've um this is something that we we've, we've known was going to happen, right? I, I know a lot of people kept saying, "Oh, I'll see, I'll believe the green line when I see it." But I think the housing folks have been preparing for a long time. Um, that being said, preparing and being able to take action are different. Thank you again, State House, and our lack of things like rent stabilization <laughs> that would have prevented the rent gouging that has resulted from the green line. So like frankly, it's it's not pretty. It's exactly what happens when you know new infrastructure um opens. And I think we just need to acknowledge that displacement is very high. Rent increases are through the roof. Um, that being said, the city is committing a money to various different places to try to um, support where it can and in different ways. So there's the early acquisition fund um, that we just funded in the last budget that set aside $8 million for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to be able to quickly purchase properties. Um, Quickly for municipalities still is not exactly super quick, um, but that money is there to be able to just purchase when something, you know, becomes available. Um, there's also funding that's been put into the flex fund and to rental assistance in general to try to stabilize folks to the extent possible. A lot of work is being done with our great partner, CAS, um, the Community Action Agency of Somerville, who are constantly, you know, advocating for our tenants. There's the... Um, They also um, facilitate um, a renter group that I'm forgetting the acronym of at this moment, but they do a ton of work in advocating. 
Hello. <laughs> in advocating for our residents and um, negotiating with landlords, trying to get landlords to, you know, be reasonable because obviously we cannot require them <laughs> to not raise their rents to the level that they are. So we are trying to provide support where we can, but we are restricted in what we can realistically do. And it is incredibly frustrating to not be able um, to better support our tenants, but in every way we can, we are. Um, and we intend to, you know, take similar action in our next budget. So obviously putting money in, uh, dedicating money in the budget towards these different, um, you know, ways to support is, is really critical. But ultimately, you know, we cannot control private landlords and what they choose to do. Um, so it creates a, a really challenging situation. Um, our Office of Housing Stability is incredibly busy. Um, they're amazing. They're doing amazing work. We are, you know, um, connecting with as many people as we can, but it is, it is, it's not a unique Somerville problem, unfortunately, and it's, it's not something that we've been able to, to stop necessarily. I, I wish I could sit here and say, yep, we've got it. It's not a problem, but the reality is that it, it absolutely is. And, um, you know, I think we're going to be seeing the effects for quite some time. We have new development and new development has resulted in a, in a situation where we have money to create an, an early acquisition fund, right? This is a double-edged sword um, because we have the, we have more funds than we have had, I don't know, maybe ever. Um, but that being said, the, a lot of the damage has already been done. A lot of displacement has already happened. This development has has been escalating for quite some time. Um, so this has been an issue for quite some time. Um, and I think, you know, we're being really thoughtful and really strategic with the, the, the money that we're getting from various ways from this development. But ultimately, what we need to do is, is um, provide more housing. Like, that's what people need. People need affordable units. And that is something that we need to work with the private market in developing. And it's not easy. And I wish we could just, it all was public housing. I don't know why we play this game with people's lives. Um, but I cannot change the system. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're pushing every button we can push. And we're working with all of you know, the pertinent community partners that are on the ground. But it's a huge, it's a huge challenge and it's a huge battle that we're fighting every day. And, and OHS, again, the Office of Housing Stability is amazing. They're doing really great work. Um, but there is only so much that we can realistically do to keep people in their homes. Thanks, Hannah. Um, let's see. I didn't see any other questions. in the chat. David does bring up um, something called the home rule petition. What I can do is I can share in the chat exactly what the home rule petition is. Um, and, and, you know, we can, you know, we can uh, do, you can do, you know, read those and, and, and learn more a bit about those. And, uh, and it, it is a, it's a, it's a resource for cities and towns, but again, it is, it is a harder, it is a, it is a hard road to hoe um, when you're, uh, when you're, when you're a city and town in Massachusetts, but it is a it is a, it is a route that cities and towns can take. So I'll try to put that in the chat before we before we uh, break up for the evening. Um, any other questions for Hannah? No. Okay. Well, I would take the chance to say just just join things and get involved. Like <laughs> we really need people who are willing to put in the time. And I know that it's a big ask and I know that it's, you know, we all have busy lives and things to do. Um, but where you can, if you see an opportunity, take it because you never know, um, you know, where you're going to, where you're going to end up. Um, and we need, you know, we need voices. We need voices that are not the same <laughs> voices um, to be heard louder and to, to make an impact. Thank you, Hannah. And um, I am putting stuff in the chat about the home petition. And one thing that I just found was from the Somerville CDC. So it's a good tie-in with Somerville. Um, and also, I, it's also a tie-in in terms of, you know, we're, we're always trying to figure out how do folks get involved. And, and it's not easy, you know, and how, how do we create a ground full of support? And it's not easy. And, and this is where... Um, the, some of the organizations, the community orgs, the agencies that we all 
work with that we all have you know gotten some of some of us have gotten our stars with and some of y'all are still working with um can come into play because you know it's hard for one person to educate and and, and create a groundswell of support on their own it's just you know life you know do we just we people have to work people have to make a living support you know support themselves their families so this is where a lot of the community agencies that we all do our work in you know, can can really make a difference. You know, I, I we talked about. I, I know I referenced the uh, um, the uh, the transliterated ballots in Chinatown that took you know so many years to 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 get in. It was it was an organization like the Chinese Progressive Association and other orgs that came together to try to fight that battle because we had one person, two people, five people couldn't do it on their own, um, and and. You know, with the sort of the CDCs, you know, the Community Development Corporation, you know, they they're a, a wonderful source. Like you know, the 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 thing that I just put in the chat about the home loan petition, the you know, Somerville CDC put that out. You know, so they're helping to educate. So you know, one way that we can do, you know, we one way we can support, you know, educating all of us and getting all of us involved is to support our community orgs as well. Um, and, you know, that, that is nothing that's, without its you know, community that, partnerships and its community point. connections. So this is, it's a really great point. I wanted to meant to make that at some point when I was talking, but yeah, absolutely. Organizations like MAPC also. So I'm glad to see MAPC folks here because I've had opportunities to work with MAPC numerous times and it's always really fruitful. Um, so, you know, <laughs> building those connections is definitely really important in making sure, you know, because the city is just one of many, right? This is all coalition building at the end of the day. Um, and that's really hard, really tedious work, but that is that is essentially, you know, what we're all doing. Um, so thank you all for the role that your organizations play in that as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Kiki just put something in the chat. It was, it's, it's uh, yeah, we all watch TV. It's, you know, where a lot of us. We can we can if we if we have time we can tune into our, our our community sort of our municipal community station to kind of find out what's going on and try to stay involved. Um, yeah. You can watch Parks and Rec. It's surprisingly <laughs> realistic. <laughs> kind of like the well, yeah, you you didn't see the video, but kind of like the I'm just a bill video that we that we all saw for the uh, for our legislative process. It's surprisingly accurate. So you know, but. Uh, but anyway, so thank you so much. If anybody else, has, if, if folks have any questions for Hannah before we before we uh, let her go, and you know, once again, thank you again, Hannah. You know, thank you for being so insightful and being so candid and um, and uh, you know and, and and encouraging. You know, really, it does it it, it and realistic. You know, it's you know, it is it is hard. It is it is not easy. Um, and so we we appreciate your your candor in that regard and and we wish you luck with everything you're doing you're always welcome to come back we'll we'll probably ask you to come back again just knowing us so <laughs> yeah, thank you for that well, it's great uh, to be here i really appreciate the opportunity and then absolutely if anybody has any follow up questions i'm happy to always happy to jump on the phone or, or you know um discuss things further i'm policy wonk that's what i do it's what i want to talk about so i'd be happy to talk about it with any of you as well 